Hey guys, Coach here. Hey, thanks for joining me. Welcome back to the channel. Glad you took a few minutes. Hey, this week we are talking about one of those uh, troublesome areas that can happen in a landscape based on either super mature landscape that you, you take over as a buyer or because of older architecture, etc. We're talking about deep shade landscape options. That's what we're discussing this week. I'm glad you're here. Let's get rolling. You know, in today's architecture, spaces like this, uh, especially in obviously new home developments, but basically the new architecture of new homes, do not lend itself to deep shade recessed landscape places. They just don't. But back in the day, back in the 70s and early to mid 80s, there were some architecture out there that really did some big cantilever things, especially deep recessed front doors and then little strips of uh, foundation planting beds and stuff. And these places that I dealt with were huge, huge no sun options. I used to call them no grow zones basically because holy cow, they never got an ounce of sunlight. They only got the ambient light that happened to be out during daytime. My first home in Hayward, California was similar to this. It got a little more light, but never any direct sunlight. And it was down at the corner of the base of some front stairs that we had. What did I do for that place? Hey, I did what you guys did. I was young, didn't know as much about landscaping then. Even though I had some experience, I tried the usual shade remedy plants. I did some azaleas and some gardenias and hydrangea and pfft, nothing did anything. They sat there for a year, never put out a new ounce of growth. And I did some pretty good planting technique. So what did I do? took it all out, put them, put those plants in other parts of the yard and they did fine. They did really, really well. For that particular spot, all I did was bring in a nice sitting bench. I did a couple of decorative rocks and I did some containerized plantings of which is the landscape option I'm gonna discuss with you in just a few minutes. All right, let's move on. So let me know in the comments below, do you have such a landscape spot in your yard? whether it's under super deep shaded mature trees or some type of cantilevered roof lines and stuff that just do not allow any light in there. Let me know in the comments below. I'd be curious as to what you have and how you've approached it. So I'll tell you what I've used in uh, deep shade landscape situations. They get a little bit of filtered sun and in some cases got no sun at all. Now remember, most of the time, I was working in a much higher USDA grow zone. I was in 9A when I retired, and I was in zone, I think it was 10 in the San Francisco Bay Area. So if this does not align with your grow zone, you might have to reach out and contact one of the local professionals and ask them what you do. But I'll tell you, the landscape option at the end of this video is going to kind of open your eyes a little bit about maybe what you can do. All right, here's some plant selections that I've used, some perennials and plant material and some shrubs that I've used where I used to live. They worked really well for me. Now, some of these went into my own private home yards. Most of them went into customers' yards. So let's start off with the perennials, shall we? One of the first ones that I really like is Brunera. Brunera is a uh, fantastic performer and despite some having some variegation and some varieties, they really do pretty good in a dark situation, like maybe less than an hour of sunlight in the morning or some deep filtered sun uh, in the afternoons or whatever you might have. They work well under story type of plantings. They work well under trees and stuff like that, provided that they're the type of trees that allow you to dig a hole big enough for them to thrive. So check out Brunera. Another one is dead nettle, also known as lamium. Lamium is another shade uh, performer that does well and it has some variegation to it. It also has some bloom to it. Dead nettle is one of those ones that kind of spreads slowly. So you want to plant them kind of close together if you're looking for a, um, a ground cover type of situation or spread them apart a little bit and you can have other things in between, such as our next selection. Another one that I used was called lungwort. 
lungwort from the pulmonaria family and it also has a bloom to it. Nice variegated foliage on some of the varieties and perform well in deep shade. So check out lungwort. It's not a gross plant at all despite its name. Another one probably needs slightly more light but it also does well in deep shaded area and that's trillium. Trillium is a native. Generally, we've seen them blooming out in the eastern mountains of the United States during the springtime. And they do have ornamental varieties that you can buy in gallon cans and stuff. Nice, nice bloom in the spring and early summer, depending on how high you are. And it also tolerates a lot of cold weather. So check out Trillium. And an old tried and true, however, I've seen them survive, but I never saw them thrive really well in deep shade, and that is the hosta family. Hostas do okay, but uh, you will see them get a little bit leggy. You will see them tend to lean towards whatever stronger ambient light, uh, but they will survive in there. So you can have a few of hosta and then mix in some other ones and have a complete package in there. So everything kind of picks up where the other one left off, so to speak. All right, let's move on. Try the fern family. Ferns, uh, some of them like a lot more light than you may think, but these varieties you might want to check out. From the polystichum family, the wood ferns, these guys are uh, naturally growing in the forest understory and in some darker, moister areas, but they can take a little drier once in a while, and they prefer to kind of dry out in between deep, infrequent waterings. Yep, the polystichum fern is a very, very popular fern and pretty readily available. So look for those guys out there as well. One of my favorites, and listen up, you cold latitudes. These guys are a deciduous fern, but oh my gosh, they can tolerate a deep, dark corner pretty well. And when they come up in the springtime, the silver and burgundy um, colors of this Japanese painted fern is something really special to look at. A great harbinger of spring, I like to call them. And it really looks good. Now it tends to fade out a little bit as the growing season goes on. It tends to be a little bit more of a little streaks of silver and more green, but new growth will always have that, that uh, dull burgundy and silver look to it. Japanese painted fern, good selection. The last one that I used pretty successfully was the splenium. It's the heart's tongue fern and it's an evergreen fern. Probably won't take the super colds. Nah, I don't think so. Uh, Asplenium tends to do well in dark corners as well. It is always an upright fern, rather broad leafed, you know, and it kind of unrolls and unfurls, just like its namesake, tongue. But it's pretty and it's shiny and it's nice when it's up above all the other things that I've mentioned so far. So it makes a good selection. All right, let's talk about shrubs a sec. Okay, one of the ones that will uh, work well, it performs best if you give it more, but it will survive if you give it less light, and that's Japanese Aurelia. It tends to get kind of big when it's really super happy and it's out in that bright filtered morning sun area, but if you stick it in a dark corner, it will stay lower, it'll tend to get a little bit leggier, and it once again, it will tend to lean towards the brightest source of light, but it does work. Another one is gold dust plant. Akuba japonica, and you can use those for uh, those dark corners. It tends to get uh, a little taller, you know, you can three, four feet in deep shade, six feet or more in bright sunlight, morning sun situation, afternoon shade, but it does have some variegation on some of the varieties, and it even has streaks of gold, so you might want to look at that. Another one that does pretty well, however, you won't find it blooming really strong for you, but it does, it does hold its own, and that's the Oregon grape. I prefer the dwarf variety, not the standard variety, but you, you can check out both varieties. The Mahonia, the Mahonia family is also an understory grower out in the forest and lots and lots of availability when it comes to uh, ornamental selection. You can find it, it also tolerates cold weather is down to the zero or below manner. And it blooms a nice yellow, blooms a nice yellow flower in the summertime and has an edible berry. Make sure you double check everything on how to prepare for that Oregon grape jam or wine. Please do use caution. And lastly, some people use it even as a house plant, but it's tougher than that. And that's the cast iron plant. Aspidistra, you can use that outside. It can go in containers 
with other things around it that do well in shade, but can also tape uh, ground plantings in a deep shaded area. I don't have any tree selections because tree selections, you're just wasting your money. You really are. And what you do plant is probably just going to start leaning and most likely it's just going to die. So don't even, don't even bother with that. Okay, let's talk about ground covers. Ground covers are uh, really limited in this and they tend to uh, not get as robust because it's in that deep dark corner. But let's talk about them. I'm gonna go through them kind of fast because you're probably familiar with them. One is baby tear. Everybody knows about baby tear and it is actually tougher than you may think. It could get zapped by frost and then pop right back. But baby tear is a deep dark thriver as well. And it will tend to uh, not be as thick a matted but it will cover the ground for you if you got a dark corner that you need some ground cover underneath uh, or against a wall or against in a bed around a water feature. Really likes a moist area, so consider that. Another one is Japanese Pachysandra. That one can be uh, really a good performer, especially if you have a little bit of filtered sunlight. That's its natural growing stage and it does well. Tends to be a run and root type of thing. It can really create a whole alternative lawn area, if you will. I have seen it and I've seen them come in and set a mower on high and mow it and have it bounce back nice, thick and lush. So consider Japanese Pachysandra. Another one, and believe it or not, sometimes it gets a bad rap, but I really like Carpet Bugle, the Ajuga family. The Ajuga family, particularly the variety Mahogany, I have used that in very shaded areas and it does really well. It's a run and root type of thing, great for rock gardens, great for running around and in between uh, gravels and boulders and that kind of stuff. Try Mahogany Ajuga, works out pretty good. Another one from the natural world, uh, especially for you northern latitude guys and gals, try uh, your Canadian bunchberry. It's from the dogwood family and it grows only about four to six inches and it is native to the understory of the northern forests. And you can check that out. Now the availability of something like that, you may have to get kind of persistent about, but it is available in containerized stuff, both four inch and gallon cans. Canadian bunchberry from the Cornus dogwood family. One of the ones that I use quite a bit, especially in between stepping stones and stuff was the dwarf mondo grass, not the standard monkey grass, but the dwarf. And I would usually plant that stuff really, really close together. Uh, and it worked really well in between, in between large flagstones and pavers and such. So consider dwarf mondo grass. Lastly, Solomon seal. Solomon seal is one that used to be many decades ago, much more popular than it is today. But it's a dark shaded, dark shaded ground cover, has a little bit of a bloom to it and performs well it likes to dry out in between waterings. So try that. All right, let's move on. Let's move on to our landscape option that I've used several times for myself and customers, and that is rotation. If you have one of these areas, one of these areas that just, they're a dead zone to put anything green in, and you know it, try rotation. Get into the habit of having some decorative sleeved pots nice ones, ones that you really like to look at, and then have some um, containerized grown color, uh, plant material, bright bloomers, whatever it might be, that you grow in another part of the yard where those guys are really happy. And you grow them in containers, and then for one week at a time, rotate them into that dark area. Let them brighten that area up for a week or so. Maybe you have something going on as far as a family event or company or whatever it might be. Maybe it's just for your own personal enjoyment. Then at the end of the week, you take those out of the sleeve and you rotate them back out and rotate some new ones back in. It's a great way to stay focused on that dark area and provide it with a, a bright illumination of blooms, uh, thriving plant material, and a little bit of happiness that goes at that deep dark front door that you might have. So rotation was a great way that I educated people and they would do it. They would take them and put them back out on the filtered sunlight of their back patio or vice versa, whatever it might've been. And they found out that it worked out really well. Besides, you're in a little bit more control over containerized plants as far as feeding, blooming, trimming, 
manicuring, and then bring them in. Works out well. Okay, lastly, kind of what I alluded to in the beginning of the show, and that is, if it's a no-grow zone, stop fighting it. Don't fight it. Try ornamentation instead. Try your benches, your chairs. Try uh, some uh, landscape lighting to illuminate it back in there and bring in a water feature. A nice trickling water feature. Not a monster, not, not anything overwhelming, but just something that gives you just that small sound of trickling water. And because it's in the dark, dark recesses of the yard, chances are the maintenance is gonna be reduced on it quite a bit because string algae and little algaes and stuff do not perform well back in the deep shade. So try a water feature, small bench, if you're under really thick trees, consider a, some type of a sitting hammock. Those things work really well, especially during the warmer months. Guys, that's what I have for you this week. Deep shade landscape options. Don't forget that rotational thing. It really works out well. And if you have a few extra minutes, I would appreciate you visiting the website and checking out the book and the digital course. We also have the 15-step DIY checklist and the maintenance checklist now. Remember, the Amazon store is always open for you. We got some good things over there. As always, to your landscape success, thanks for tuning in. See you guys next week. Bye for now.